I want to suggest to you also that it's a minority of people who ever reach this stop of brokenness, less than 5%. We know that. See, in, in order to be broken, one of the things that I discovered out of the research is that we have to allow people to experience pain and suffering and hardship. A lot of times we think, well, brokenness only comes with persecution. Yes, but there's different types of persecution. It's not all about the government taking away our freedoms. A lot of times that kind of persecution will come in other forms. Here's what I found through the research. There are a number of different crises that God allows us to experience in our life. And in point of fact, a majority of people who are broken of sin, self, and society are broken by experiencing these traumatic events in their life. There were six in particular that I found a majority of, of broken people have experienced. Things like an ugly and acrimonious divorce. Things like having to declare personal bankruptcy. Things like spending time in prison. Things like contracting some kind of a, a debilitating disease or having some kind of debilitating injury. Matters such as losing all of your stuff in a natural disaster, such as a, a flood or a fire or a hurricane, or things such as having somebody you are very close to and love very much die a prolonged, agonizing death. What I found is that most people who become broken are broken through those kinds of traumas that take place in their life. And hear this. In our culture today, we are so resilient that it takes more than one of those kinds of crises to break us. Almost every broken person that I studied in the course of the tens of thousands of interviews that I did over the six years in trying to understand this, every one of them went through multiple crises. It's, it's a difficult thing because in the church, when we see people going through a crisis, or for instance, when they get to the stop, of holy discontent. When we see people that are hurting, when we see them in pain, our natural inclination is to rush up alongside them, put our arm around them, and move them to a place of comfort. And you know what we're doing? We're negating what the Holy Spirit is doing at that moment in their lives. We've got to be very, very careful that we love people, yes, that we support them, yes, but that we don't overtake what God is trying to do in their life at that moment through these difficult circumstances. You see, in our culture, nobody wants to be broken. We see brokenness as weakness. We see it as defenselessness. We see it as being a victim. We see it as people who become dependent. We see it just as a negative reality. But Jesus says to us, you become strong when you become weak and I give you my strength. It's only my strength that matters in your life. So yes, we've got to allow those kinds of situations to have an impact in our people's lives. So, I mean, I'm sharing all these things with you. I hope you understand the, the incredible significance of grasping the stops on the journey, the kinds of obstacles that people are likely to encounter, the kinds of support that we can bring to our people in enabling them to become transformed human beings. But in kind of wrapping this up, what can you do? Let me just give you a couple very practical things. Number one, in addition to all that we've talked about, I want you to examine the journey that you are on personally. See, one of the challenges that we face as leaders and teachers and pastors is you cannot give people what you don't have. Now, I'm not saying you can't inform people about things you haven't experienced. But so much of what people pursue is what they see modeled in the lives of people they know and trust. Do they know and trust you? I sure hope so. Probably so. And if that's the case, what is it that you're modeling for them in terms of the transformational journey that you're taking? Is it just about learning more scriptures and applications? Is it just about feeling 
differently towards other people in need? Or is there greater depth that God wants to bring you through? When Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and people in like manner, he talked about the fact that this transformational journey is four-dimensional. Your thoughts, your feelings, your behavior, your spirit all need to be transformed in this process. What's that process like in your life? Can you lead them down that journey? Understand where you're at and where you need to go and lead people along with you. A second thing I'd ask you to do is to inform your people about these things that you're learning now. Now that you understand more about the journey and the ultimate destination, which is to love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, to love people in that same kind of extreme manner because now God can love them through you, people need to understand that's where we're going. See, when we went to seminary, we were kind of taught a ministry map. But the map was a circular map. And the idea was to get people in the middle of that map. And what we would do is we would keep teaching them how to worship, how to evangelize. We'd try to teach them to be disciples. We'd teach them about stewardship and service and, and being part of authentic community. And all that's well and good. But you see, we never get outside of ourselves. We never have that kind of vertical relationship with God. We never have that kind of horizontal relationship with people when we stay enmeshed in that circle that we've been taught. We need to understand the true map that takes us to where God wants to take us. Another thing that I think is important for you to, to consider is investing more of your ministry resources in bringing people to what I call the lonely stops. The lonely stops. Brokenness, surrender and submission. I mean, who of their own accord wants to go there? In my church, I was teaching on brokenness one week, and afterwards, one of the key women in our congregation came up and, and said to me, brokenness? Are you kidding me? Who wants to go there? And I understand what she's saying. She didn't yet grasp the significance of what brokenness means in her own spiritual maturity, in her own ability to be Christ-like, in her capacity to be holy because God is holy and he's called us to be holy, she didn't see that brokenness had to be a part of that. She thought that simply accepting Christ as her Savior and being a good person, a good mother, a pillar in the church, all of that was enough. It's not. And it takes time to help people to get there. We've got to invest time and energy and resources in enabling people to get to the lonely stops. Uh, fourthly, let me suggest to you that you develop a new set of metrics about what is success in your ministry. Again, I know from my research that in most churches, success is based upon measures that we take, things that we measure. Attendance, how much money we raise, how many programs we have, how many staff we've hired, and how much square footage we've built out. See, and I applaud churches for measuring things but you've got to measure the right stuff. You see, when we talk about attendance and budget and program staff and square footage, keep in mind, Jesus didn't die for any of that. He didn't die to fill auditoriums. He didn't die to build a new wing on the building. He died so that people would understand and pursue holiness. He died so that they would become whole through him and it's this transformation process that enables that. Well, if that's the case, then you're going to need a whole new set of metrics. And Jesus taught us that it's the fruit from a person's life that really shows us where they're at on this journey. You're going to need to have metrics that, that look at these kinds of fruit. Uh, people who are creating more peace in every situation they go to. Individuals who are showing greater kindness and generosity every place they go. Individuals who are working hard at and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform them so that they don't have enemies where they go. They don't have opponents. Having a congregation where because of this transformational journey there are fewer divorces, there's less spousal abuse, there's less child abuse. Uh, finding instances where there's so much more self-control evident in people's lives and you can see that in fewer bankruptcies, in less debt, 
in less obesity, fewer people struggling with addictions, uh, people living a simpler life, uh, maybe having new kinds of habits that we can identify where throughout the day people are constantly praying with, they're communicating with God, not just when they sit down to meals or when they wake up or go to bed. Maybe where we can find people now are thinking of worship as a lifestyle where they're looking at every action that's taking place in their life as being an opportunity to worship God, to do something that honors Him, blesses Him, brings Him glory, brings them into greater connection with Him. You know, maybe where, where we can be measuring instances of moral behavior, whether it's lying or cheating or stealing or whatever it may be, all of these kinds of things, that's what we need to be looking for. And maybe the best way for us to be doing measurement is through the relationships, the intimacy of the relationships that are built within the groups of people under our covering. And so maybe it's not going to be so much about sheer numbers as it's going to be about conversations and connections and observations, a different form of accountability. Finally, let me suggest to you that re you re-examine the pace of your ministry. I want to warn you, if you're going to be in the transformation business, which, by the way, as you look at your mission statement for your church, transformation is what you exist to bring about. That's why the church exists. Well, if you're going to be in the transformation business, understand that you've got to be in it for the long haul. This isn't something that happens overnight. And so your strategies, your plans, your relationships all have to be built with the notion that this is a long-term process. In fact, when you and I and the people that we work and minister with die, we won't be completely transformed. We won't be completely transformed until we're joined with God in heaven. But on this side of heaven, we need to move down that transformational path as far as we can. It's my prayer that the things that we've talked about here today give you a new passion, a new understanding for what could be happening within our church, within your body of believers that you have the opportunity to influence. I pray to God that you will take this information to heart that you will examine what you're doing in ministry and you will look at where are your people on this journey. You will look at the different possibilities that you have for perhaps changing what you're doing in ministry to make sure that you're doing everything you can possibly do to help people make progress on the journey. I'm hoping that maybe the book Maximum Faith will help you to understand and unpack some of these things even more deeply. I encourage you to visit the MaximumFaith.com website because it will have more and more information on it as well as other resources to help you in facilitating this kind of transformation. But know this, as leaders, this is what we've been called to do, is to help people become who God made them to be. May God bless you and help you in that process.